society as affected by the state becomes fundamentally subservient to the market. Um, that the way people live is, is formed by their ability to work, you know, and it's, and it's work patterns and availability that defines how we live, rather than the other way around. And she instead contends that there is an embeddedness of markets in society, that, that, that markets fundamentally serve a social role, and that if they do not ultimately serve a social role and are embedded in society, that they become destructive. Which leads us to an idea, now I touched on before, the issues of having a, a, a system that is only based in nation states. And that's where international law still is. Um, so, but in globalization, whatever happens in one part of the world has effects in the rest of the world. We're dealing with problems of a global nature, but we're trying to deal with it as individual competing entities based in nation state borders. So communities are becoming more vulnerable to pressures and incentives that originate at other levels, international, global levels of social, political, and economic organization. Um, and, and organizing and, and attempting to organize on a national scale and deal with these issues through national structures um, has become less and less effective as time has gone on. And the, the most heavily excluded groups have traditionally been indigenous peoples, poor people, from whom social movements have emerged. And, and explicitly, we've heard of anti-globalization movements. These are movements that are, that are international, that exist uh, throughout the world, um, regardless of, of the wealth of the country. They exist in, in Bolivia, they exist in Haiti. Um, they've also had an efflorescence in, in, in the wealthiest country in the world, in Seattle, in Washington. And they form the exact sort of protective counter-movement that Polanyi was referring to. Where this will lead us, and we'll get to this at the end, is, is an idea of global constitutionalism that we as, we, as we deal with and countenance the problems that exist on a global scale, that the only way to deal with them effectively is through legal structures and political structures and conceptual structures that operate on a global level. An idea of, as uh, one of the Green Party MPs, Kennedy Graham, recently renamed his portfolio from uh, foreign affairs to global affairs. Mm -hmm. Moving away from that conception, okay, that's, a, that's a fundamental shift in worldview. Um, and this was someone who had a long career as a, as a diplomat um, with MCAT as well, and, and experienced firsthand the limitations of having teams of, uh, because diplomats, they're no slouches, they're all top-notch negotiators. So everybody goes in, they negotiate hard, and they get themselves a deal that's good for their country, but terrible for the world as a whole. So this shift more to global affairs and, and thinking, and particularly looking at legal structures and legal documents that transcend the Westphalian nation mm -hmm. state. That term Westphalian refers to the formation of nation states as we know them in, in the, the peace of Westphalia, which is when the nation state as we know it, rather than the many small warring city states of Europe, took form into countries as we know them. So a multi-level governance, multi-level meaning something that happens not just on the national scale, but also not just on the global scale. Because real change has to happen at the local level, and often at the very local level. But operating on a purely local level isn't enough. Operating on a purely global level is ineffective. Operating only on a national level doesn't get results. We have to work on all of these levels at once, and they need to be at levels that are speaking to each other and communicating with each other. This may sound a bit esoteric right now, and I'll be giving you some far more concrete examples of what this means in just a moment. It requires a trans-civilizational perspective. And we need to be able to look beyond, this is how we do things in the West, or the global North and the global South, um, and exporting an idea of the Anglo-American model of, this is what democracy is. Democracy is good, and everybody has to have our structure of democracy, or they're wrong, um, etc. Um, and these things need to be challenged. We need to have something that moves beyond that. In, in Latin America in particular, this movement towards a global constitutionalism has started first at the level of regional integration. This is the logo of ALBA, the Alianza Bolivarianos de los Pueblos de Nuestra America, the Bolivarian Alliance for the People of Our America. It was first called uh, the Bolivarian Alternative the name was changed to Alliance in 2009 as they got larger. This was a grouping of countries who are expressly and explicitly 
anti-neoliberal and particularly anti the Washington Consensus. Washington Consensus being another name for the, the, the neoliberal uh, measures, <coughs> uh, particularly through the IMF and the World Bank, the tranche of privatizations that were imposed from North America as a, as a way of dominating these countries. The word Bolivarian comes from this splendid looking gentleman, Simon Bolivar, who is an absolute hero, or as his, his full aristocratic title is, Simon José Antonio de la Santísima Trinidad Bolivar y Palacios Fonti Blanco, also known as El Liberador, less of a mouthful, the Liberator. This was the person, because in Latin America, as um, uh, the, the, the writer Eduardo Galeano sums this up beautifully, he says that Latin America, um, South America in general, but particularly Latin America, has been under the yoke of one empire or another for centuries the Spanish for 500 years, and in more recent times, um, the North American, a far more settled empire. His legacy is, is very clear in these countries. He formed a, a, a very large territory, um, ejected the Spanish, and were right there on the other side of the Atlantic, at the very top there, and for this was one country called Gran Colombia. It was an inherently unstable entity, and it didn't last for long, it was about 22 years. But as you can see in the modern flags of Ecuador and Venezuela, this is a template, this is a model. What he did has remained, has remained fundamental um, to the vision of, of a free and independent Latin America, free from colonial or continued colonial domination. Very explicit, in fact. Um, the original alliance of Alba was between um, Cuba an old enemy of the US, and Venezuela. Um, Cuba, after what they call a special period in the early 90s, uh, when uh, the United States imposed an economic embargo, saying that if any country brings a boat to Cuba, they will not be allowed to dock in America for at least six months. Um, so it was an embargo that meant that nobody came to Cuba, and Cuba ended up completely starved of um, oil, petrol, gas, a lot of very necessary uh, imports. So they formed an alliance with the, um, with the very, very oil rich um, but impoverished of Venezuela. And they formed an alliance whereby, and this is where it began, whereby the two would, uh, Cuba would send, it, pardon me, Venezuela would send its oil and gas to Cuba. Um, and uh, Cuba, which has produced um, far more doctors than have been needed in the country for decades, um, have very impressive educational programs, etc., um, exported their knowledge and their, their model and sense of social equity and their <coughs> experts in particular and their medical supplies and their doctors and so on over to Venezuela in an exchange. The idea being that they would gradually build an alliance to resist the domination of North America. So we saw, we saw Grand Colombia, and we've seen the sort of the downward pressure that's, that's sort of fractured this alliance of countries a little more. I feel like a weatherman. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> so the original alliance was between Cuba and Venezuela in 2004. And as we can see, in quite rapid order, um, as basically uh, what was called a, a rather derisively a, a pink tide swept throughout Latin America of left-leaning governments. Um, actually relatively moderate. Certainly none of them were overtly Marxist or communist or anything like that. Far more nuanced. Um, but a left-leaning line of governments came in, um, particularly in reaction to the, to the, the sort of neoliberal governments of the, of the 1990s, um, and, and, and swept throughout that area. Um, of course, the big, the big block here, really, the reason all of these don't join up is that, is that Colombia is there, and Colombia and North America have a very, very close economic and military relationship. So these countries all gradually joined. Um, the real trigger point for, for this union happening, and, and particularly the involvement of indigenous peoples, whose, whose uh, cosmovision, worldview, um, and approach has become fundamental to the movement, um, was with the um, election of Evo Morales in Bolivia. He was the country's first indigenous president. First indigenous president. Bear in mind, this is a country where 60% or so of the population are indigenous Aymara people of the Andes. So there are some special guest members, Suriname and Santa Lucia, 
an observer nation of Haiti, those three all intend to join when we can, and a former member, Honduras, which uh, withdrew after um, a right-wing coup in 2009. So there's the two next to each other. There's the ideal, the vision of current Colombia, and the current members of the, of the Elder Alliance. So they have been talking about uh, coming up with a unified currency, um, which they would call the, the Sucre, um, which would be a, a regional currency um, that would be pegged and that would be used for trade between the countries. Um, and they've executed a number of uh, trade agreements between them, um, which unlike usual free trade agreements aren't based purely on, on contractual terms and commercial advantage, but also have quite substantial social equity provisions uh, built into them. And they have on the whole, um, the, the reading from, from um, political observers um, and academics in the area is that on the whole, they have dramatically lifted the standards of living in those countries. Um, in, in some of these countries, um, in Venezuela, um, Ecuador, Bolivia, there is um, universal health care, universal education, um, you know, uh, or, or very close to <coughs> some of those countries. And many of the others are well on the way to rolling out these programs, um, which are very, very fo focused on social equity. One of the challenges is that these are largely financed by resource extraction. But uh, the predominant view um, is, is encapsulated by the view red before green. You have to look after social equity before taking care of the environment. Is the theory. So that indigenous movements are, are, are fundamental to these countries. And it's actually the, the decentralization that was caused. It was actually that breaking of, of intense state control that was caused in the neoliberal era, where the state basically gradually pulled back from social provision, gradually pulled back from regu regulation until its role was essentially as a, as a conductor of business, that created the space for a resurgence of civil society and indigenous, civil society and indigenous organizations. And the, the indigenous movements that are now dominant had their organizational roots in the, in the campesino movement of, of farmers and peasants who began to organize without fear of the, of the drastic reprisals that they had been subject to in, in previous centuries and decades and were now free to organize because the state was not really any longer interested in what went on out in the countryside. So ironically, it was this, this, this movement against neoliberal globalization essentially came from the space that was left by its demand that the state vacate the areas of, of social provision. Um, there's a Kunai, which is a, a, a an anagram, a, a very long one in Spanish, which I won't attempt to pronounce. Um, formed in the, in the 1990s, um, which formed, um, which operated on many levels nationally, um, forming particularly in, um, in, in Bolivia and Ecuador, um, but also across Latin America, and also reaching out globally, and these are, these are connections that have remained very strong and grown stronger, of indigenous peoples around the world who are largely engaged in, in, in more or less very similar struggles of being, of being dispossessed disadvantaged, you know, that the, the dispossessed indigenous people around the world um, have a lot in common, you know, and despite being in very different parts of the world and having on the face of it great differences, there have been very strong global alliances that have been built, and this has been one of the real nodal points of that. This is very important for where we're about to go with the development of these constitutions, because it's these organizations that led to, essentially, the form of highly participatory democracy and consultation. <coughs> that led to what, what are known as the constituent assemblies, which actually drafted the constitutions of Bolivia and Ecuador. Uh, Venezuela's in 1999 was, um, was passed at the ascension of Hugo Chavez, who was um, at that point kind of on his own. Um, and, and there wasn't this larger movement at the time of, of heads of state that he could work with. Um, but by 2008-2009, um, this, this participatory, participatory movement had uh, very clearly taken root. And, and the demands of the indigenous groups, um, the people who were the real drivers behind this, was that the constituent assemblies be um, highly participatory. These are, their, these are their emblems, these fantastic flags. These are the, the two dominant uh, indigenous groups um, in the Andes, the Andean mountains, um, were that they are uh, going right back to the time of the Mayans. That's, that's these people. These are the Mayans, the inventors of zero. 